Hey guys, we want you to become a Babylon Bee subscriber to help support us in our fight against censorship and our new legal action we're taking against the New York Times. More like the New York Slimes. <laughs> oh man. That's defamation. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but you know, there's also benefits to being a Babylon Bee subscriber. Yeah, there are. Not just helping us out. You get ad-free browsing. Ah, who, who, who likes ads? Nobody. I do. Oh, Except for a marketing This guy. ad yeah. is a great ad. Oh, yeah. That, he does marketing, so he likes Yeah, it. he likes ads. Weirdo. I read Whatever. the ads on Facebook. <laughs> yeah, there you go. You get a 20% discount in our store, and you get free, for a limited time, the Babylon Bee Sacred Texts. You get that of the Babylon B premium That's annual not the title. subscription. It's upside down. And it is beautiful. It is glorious. You get access to full-length podcasts, comments, forums, premium articles, extended versions of our videos, and bloopers. bloopers. There's all kinds of fun. Behind the scenes. As one Babylon of those shills that buys all the Babylon B things, my life is happier because of it. Your life is much happier. Oh, you're a real subscriber, so you can attest. I, I saw him in the comments yesterday. Okay. Arguing with people. Nice. Yep. <laughs> Did you ever get? Yeah, first you get to see all the first? sausage outtakes. No, <laughs> and what the heck is the deal with Furt? Furt. What is, the D? Someone, it's a someone thing, tried to get first once and made a typo, and then it oh. became a thing. Is this still an ad? <laughs> it's oh yeah. It's a, so become a Babylon B subscriber. Babylonb.com slash plans. Good cop. Great cop. No, oh no, it's supposed to be bad cop. Ah, it's subverting your expectations because we do comedy. <laughs> is that what comedy is? Yeah, subverting expectations. Just purely subverting expectations. Okay. Halt. Oh, stop right there. Oh, that's a different intro. <laughs> <laughs> we talked to a cop today. We did. And his name is Greg Kading. Yeah. If you watch crime documentaries, you've probably seen him. He's in a lot of them. And if you haven't, he just has that look that you would have yeah. seen him in a crime, true crime documentary. Like he has those eyes like, I've seen a lot, kid. Yeah. Yeah. And he wrote a book called Murder Rap. Murder rap. I was going to say murder cop. <laughs> That's not right. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a movie. Yeah. It's like Axe Cops. Yeah. Evil axe murder. twin murder cop. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So he wrote, he wrote a book called Murder Rap about the, uh, du- the rivalry between Biggie and Tupac and both of their deaths. And yeah. And I guess he investigated it all. And like, he, was like, he says he knows who did it, even though nobody's been convicted. Well, he didn't even make the claim like, I know who did it. He's like, it's known. This is the objective fact that these yeah. are the guys who did it. Right. And there's just never been a conviction or yeah. anything like that. So it's interesting. So we talked about that A some, little bit, not the whole, yeah. But we just fascinated talking about to a cop. So we talked about everything from the Chauvin trial to just the whole culture right now. And we kept trying to dig great stories out of them because that's like the best thing when you talk to a cop because they have crazy lives. And they don't realize how crazy their lives are because they'll just be matter-of-factly like, well, yeah, I guess there's this one time that this meth head like burst through a wall like the Kool-Aid man and started attacking me with a wrench or whatever. But like... And to them, that's day to day. Like for them, yeah. that's like writing an article for you. Yeah. So one thing to know about this episode, if you like a good cop story, the best by far is in the subscriber portion. <laughs> we heard about a... We heard an insane An insane story. story. That's all I'm going to say. It involves a naked woman running on a power line. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> you, now you gave it away. Well, no, no that's, that's only part of the story. That's the only part. The story kept getting better. <laughs> <laughs> it felt like you we were in a, like a writers meeting for Looney Tunes and they're like yeah. and then yeah an anvil falls and you're like Is and this every too moment much? you think oh yeah she's g- that's going to end her but she just keeps she going just keeps going <laughs> PCP kids don't PCP. try it don't do PCP all right let's welcome to the studio everybody at the same time welcome Greg Kading are you enjoying our uh, photoshops on the wall Greg uh, uh, is this um, Zach Galifianakis. <laughs> <laughs> Is G- it? G.K. Chesterton. G.K. Chesterton. Oh, okay. I thought maybe it was one of his... <laughs> but now okay. I need to see... A biopic? The biopic of... Oh, is that? G.K. Chesterton, <laughs> oh. played by... <laughs> He's an old author we're big fans of. Okay. Zach Gavilopagus. Gavilopagus. Yeah, Snuffleupagus. Snuffleupagus. <laughs> well, hi, Greg. Thanks for coming on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well... Yeah, here we are. Are we started? And we're started. All right, well, we got Greg Kading here. Yeah. Now, I don't know if, if you watch crime documentaries, uh, Greg, you're like on a number of them, correct? Like, I I know when I s- looked you up, I was like, oh, wait, I've, I've seen this guy. I realized I had just seen you in, there's a Netflix documentary, I don't know what it's called, about this hotel. And Cecil. 
this hotel cecil yeah you're in that one right yeah yeah so. me and my old partner my uh homicide partner before i retired we're both kind of featured in it he actually worked on the case i okay. was more of a talking head nice so how many how many of those have you done you know, I retired in 2010 and I did an early like VHS, uh, um, V, is it not VHS? VH1. Oh, VH1. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I'm dating myself. That's old I used to watch yeah. V. Yeah. yeah. Um, it was and, Betamax. And, yeah. and it just <laughs> spiraled into once I did that, I just started kind of getting more and more, you know, um, uh, introduced and immersed into doing crime docs. So, huh. yeah. So you, got just, that, you got that grizzled cop screen presence really <laughs> <laughs> yeah like is that a, offensive i'd take i'd be super complimented by that yeah, that's a compliment <laughs> yeah i like when people say you don't act like a cop I'm, a, I'm cool with them saying you look like a cop but i like it when they say you don't act like a cop yeah yeah you look like a, a cop like you were a cop and now you're like here's how the streets are yeah I can talk is, freely now. Yeah, yeah in the is. buddy cop movie, when the young guy comes up and he's like, you know, you're, you're your last day on the job and you're retiring. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When the young guy time comes in. Yeah. And you're the old grizzled guy who doesn't play it's by the that rules. Old, not that old. Right. Not that old, but in the context of the buddy comedy. Yeah. And you know that the, one of the great shows that had to do that, that kind of juxtaposition between the young cop who's raring to go and then the old cop who's on his way out was, do you, do you guys remember Crash? With Sean Penn and Robert Duvall. No. Is this before you guys? Great movie back mm. uh, back in the day. Sean Penn was the young cop and Robert Duvall was the guy on his way out. That's one question I had. I was going to save it for later, but what are like cop shows that you like? Two, particularly, okay. because I think these two shows really nail on the head what law enforcement is like. You watch CSI and all these other crime dramas, and it's just like, okay, so unrealistic. There's nothing mm -hmm. about this that is coming close to how it actually is. So out of Baltimore years ago came a uh, series called The Wire. Oh, yeah. See the, Wire. the Wire, it was on HBO. It, it, it nails it. Like mm. That's the true gritty bureaucracy. Hacksaw. Pardon my language. You're good. Stuff that goes... <laughs> um, on in law enforcement, but then and then kind of m merse that with Reno nine one one. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> and those are the two best cop shows. <laughs> if you can somehow you know integrate those two shows, you know exactly what it's like in law enforcement. I want to see that show. <laughs> I've seen Reno nine one one. I haven't seen The Wire, mm -hmm. so I've only got half the picture. Yeah, yeah The Wire is a very slow moving. If it does feel like they're trying to make it exactly like you're following real... I actually news. watched like the first eight minutes the other night of the first episode of The Wire. Oh, really? And then my wife got home. And yeah. yeah. It's, <laughs> it, it's a slow developing yeah. bit. Once you're in it, the characters are so well... Um, so well... Uh, um, developed. It's, it's fantastic. Really good mm -hmm. show. So what are the worst cop shows? Again, or movies? It, it's those, you know... Those prime time ones that are on all the time, and I don't want to talk trash on, you know, <laughs> popular television programs, but it's the ones where they solve it in 30 minutes, mm -hmm. you know, where they get their DNA results back, you know, with a phone call um, from the crime scene. <laughs> and so it's, you know, the, the ones that are really unrealistic. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, CSI, uh, NCIS, those kinds of things. You yeah. said those, not me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For the record, Greg loves those shows. <laughs> So you, I assume, so this, definitely a big milestone, to say the least. You were involved in the uh, investigation of the uh, murder of Notorious B.I.G., also known as Biggie Smalls. It's the same guy, right? Yeah, it's yep. the same guy. Mm -hmm. And Tupac Shakur. Uh, not the same guy. Different not the guy. same guy. That's yep. Tupac and Shakur, his partner. No, 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 yeah. Tupac Shakur is one guy. Oh, okay. Yep. <laughs> and bi and then Biggie, Biggie Smalls, and Horace B.I.G. is one guy. That's all one guy. My Not heavy either. That's a different guy. That's a different guy. Okay. That's yeah. a different guy. Yeah. All right. So you wrote a book. Um, they just kind of give us that story of like how you came to, to this point, like from that whole thing. So introduction. I ended up, we, we were doing a reinvestigation of Biggie's case in Los Angeles because there was a big lawsuit against the city. There was a claim that there was uh, police corruption involved, cover up, and that, you know, even to the extent that they were saying that some officers were involved in the murder. So that mm -hmm. led to a lawsuit against the city. And then that lawsuit wind its way through the court. Um, at one point in time, our department, now this is almost 10 years after the fact, so this is in 2006, Biggie got killed in 97. 
10 years after the fact, um, they were like, hey, let's reinvestigate it. Let's see what this lawsuit's, if there's any, you know, anything to it that's true. And uh, so that's how I got recruited to work Biggie's case. Biggie's case has always been believed to be connected to Tupac's because he's only murdered six months earlier in Vegas. And there's all this rivalry going on between them. Mm -hmm. So we ultimately get to the point where we get people to confess their their roles in both of the murders. And, um, and the lawsuits dropped. And so at that point in time, the LAPD is like, okay, we're done with this investigation. You know, we're not going to be able to prosecute anybody. The lawsuits dropped. And I thought, well, there's so much that we learned in the investigation. The public's never going to know unless somebody kind of steps away and tells them. Mm. I couldn't tell the story while still being on the job because it's a conflict of interest. So I retired. I was prepared to retire. I'd, you know, law enforcement had run its course for me. So I retired, wrote a book. And the book then was turned into a documentary, and the documentary then turned into a, a limited series on Netflix. Mm -hmm. the book and the documentary called Murder Rap, and then the Netflix series was called Unsolved. I watched a few episodes in preparation for this interview. So what's it like watching a guy play you on a show? Because you're the, the guy with the backwards hats, you, right? Yeah, yeah. You wear a backwards hat ever? I, I used to. Okay. And so the, that actor, Josh Demel, he was really, really cool, really down-to-earth guy. Um, nothing pretentious about him at all. So I was really happy that they had selected him to, you know, kind of be my, um, you know, to represent me. And um, so he would be like, well, what did you used to do? And I said, oh, I always had my hat on backwards. So he would then try to <laughs> emulate that. And it was a lot of fun doing that series. And uh, of course, there's creative license taken, but um, I think they nailed it as far mm. as the accuracy of what happened, not mm. only in the case, but in the investigation. So... Because the, 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 I'm so new to this, but basically it seems that there, there hasn't been anybody convicted in the murder of either of these guys. No, no, there's, there's never even been a prosecution in them. So um, charges have never been filed. By the time we got the confessions um, of the co by a couple of co-conspirators, one in each murder, um, most of the people had already died. You know, most of them had, you know. Like gang violence. Gang violence. Such, yeah. yeah, different, yeah, different street type of mm -hmm activities that led to their deaths the only people really standing now are you know and i don't know if you qualify this as standing but suge knight who's basically doing life in prison mm -hmm. and on an unrelated thing on an unrelated thing okay yeah. yep another murder though oh and then uh um the co-conspirators that both confessed they they escaped any prosecution hmm. so would you say that you know or are pretty confident you know who killed but you can't it's just What's that situation? Well, it kind of sucks because it's bittersweet. Like, we do know. Like, okay. there's no doubt whatsoever in my mind. I know exactly that Orlando Anderson is a Southside Crip. He shot and killed Tupac Shakur. He'd gotten into a fight with Tupac earlier that night at uh, the okay. MGM yeah, okay. uh, in Vegas. So, the same guy that Tupac got in a fight with came back and shot him and killed him. And then there was a retaliation of that because when Tupac was shot, sitting next to him in the car was Suge Knight. And they were very close. Mm -hmm. It was his, you know, number one artist on his label. So Suge Knight then retaliated and had Biggie killed. And he used a gang member by the name of Wardell Faust. Um, they called him Poochie. And Wardell came, went to the uh, auditorium where where Biggie was at and waited outside and shot and killed him. Hmm. Shot and killed him. Poochie's hmm. not the same guy as Puffy? No, Puffy. So he's the CEO of Bad Boy um, record label back on the um, East Coast. He was the CEO of the label that Biggie belonged to. That was Bad, Bad Boy, Boy Records. And yeah. Death Row was the West Coast one? Correct. Yeah, yeah see, I'm getting it. Yeah, these yeah. are all rappers, by the way, for the, <laughs> not, the not homeschoolers at home. These yeah, are, this is not a dragon. rapper, gangster rap. Don't listen right. to it, homeschoolers. <laughs> 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 yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, what was it like? So the, I mean, I don't know how involved you were in gang-related violence or any, what you consider this, but like, you got thrust into a world, it seems like, uh, you know, this whole East Coast, West Coast rap battle stuff, like, what was it like being thrust into yeah, that? Yeah, were you like a young recruit? Like, I want to go into gang violence. Or, I mean, how did <laughs> well, at the time this happened, 2006, I had already been a cop for almost 20 years. Okay. So, and I had been working gangs and narcotics in the yeah, streets. Yeah, you're in LAPD, probably. Yeah. See a lot of that. So, the only thing that was really new about it for me was just the genre of music and, you know, kind of the, the, the music culture of it all. And that's why I brought a partner of mine on. Um, who really, really understood that world. The guy named Darren Dupree, an African-American guy that really enjoys, you know, that, uh, or at least paid attention to that type of music, worked in the clubs in Los Angeles. So he was the perfect guy to partner up with because he could give a lot of insights into, 
the music culture. It could be like, like Skrilla means money. <laughs> it, it, that is exactly, <laughs> yeah, that is exactly the type of thing he would do. He's like, hey, Greg, uh, you sound really white, so I'm going to help you understand. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. What, what's unexpected? I mean, going into that, we're working, you know, I assume you had to interview a lot of these people and the, just, is there anything kind of unexpected about that world or some of the, the people you had to interact with? No, I, you know, the, every, for the most part, everybody was uncooperative. You know, mm -hmm. Everybody was kind of stricken to that, st that street code and not really being as forthright as they could have been, which would have helped to make progress in the investigation. But we're used to that. You know? Yeah. We're kind of just accustomed to that type of reaction when we're doing these investigations. So there was nothing really surprising about it um, other than, in the, and this is in hindsight, what surprises me about it is how simple it actually all was, mm. but yet here we are 25 years later and it's still considered an, an officially unsolved case. Mm. And that's frustrating because it's like the, those things don't really seem to, you know, make sense. Mm -hmm. How could it be so simple but yet unsolved? But it is. Now in TV shows, when they, they say a case is unsolved, and like we're closing the book on this, then the cop goes rogue. And then, like, solves it all in the streets where, like, everything's blowing Vigilante. up. Do you ever do yeah. that? <laughs> <laughs> that you can tell us about? <laughs> uh, well, some of the times there's no statute of limitations on this stuff, so you do need to be a little bit cautious. Um, no, I mean, when I retired, I still continued to stay engaged in trying to get more information about both of those cases. Hmm. And, you know, started develop, developing relationships with people that, either hadn't been identified or hadn't been willing to come forward. So it continued to kind of evolve. Hmm. And, um, you know, at least with that case. But, yeah, I, you know, law enforcement, people don't realize that a large majority, a large number of homicides in Los Angeles, at least, go unsolved. Hmm. Like the majority. Hmm. You know, it's over 50% that don't get solved. And uh, it's, it's, it's just an unfortunate that uh, this one had a lot of attention because there's celebrity components. Mm -hmm. But down in South Central and other areas of Los Angeles, you know, there's just stacks and stacks and stacks of unsolved cases on the shelves of the LAPD. Hmm. Wow. And, and now is gang violence as bad today as it was back then? Or has it gotten better? Or It's different. So, mm -hmm. You know, it's a little bit more, it's, it's less apparent. Like uh, back in this, you know, back in the 80s and 90s, the gangsters were hanging out on street corners with their rags in their pockets, wearing their colors, and it was very apparent who they were. That all kind of took a turn when I, you know, as they began to realize this is not in our best interest to just <laughs> stand out here like sore thumbs, drawing attention. So things kind of went a little bit more, um, you know, less apparent, less present, but they're still, you know, obviously a, a lot of gang activity in Los Angeles. And of course you have now the big transnational gangs like MS 13 that, you know, they're all over the, the world, but they've mm. completely integrated themselves into all different areas of, uh, of society. Mm -hmm. It's, su it's such a big thing. Like I don't even know where to start with asking questions. Like there's so much, like, I just want to like, I, I want, I have to be honest, like whenever I meet a cop, I just want to like sit back and be like, just tell me some of your stories. Light up a cigar. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, light up a cigar. Pour a little whiskey. Tell me all your crazy stories because I assume, because I used to, when I, I used to live in a Coos Bay, a small town in Oregon, and I was, became good friends with the guy who became the chief of police, this old Boston guy, and just sitting and listening to him tell his stories from being a cop, some of my favorite things. So well, you got a few of your top stories from being a cop? I do, and what, what what happens, at least for me, is the you know these stories. You've got a thousand of them, yeah. But you just they aren't readily available until what happens is two cops will start sitting down, yeah. So and that's a trigger, right? It's a trigger, and then and then you go into this whole thing where you're trying to one up each other, yeah. like, uh -huh. oh, that's a good one, yeah. but let me tell you about what happened to me. Yeah. And so there's this weird kind of dynamic that happens so often. So do you need us to make up some stories? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I one came to mind. This one okay. was really weird, and I'll try to make it really brief. There's I like this, weird. Yeah. So there's this guy guy that uh, um, I'll just his name's Robert I won't give his last name who was um, in a long-term relationship with another man and uh, that man died of emphysema and then Robert found himself after a really long-term relationship um, becoming very promiscuous and going out and going to the clubs and, and, and he's, he's an older guy he's in his late 50s hmm. and um, and picking up on people 
And so he ends up picking up on a guy and they go back to his house and that individual both robs him and kills him. Mm. So three days, Robert hasn't shown up for work. He's dead in his house. Three days later, his employer, who is L.A. County, or I'm sorry, L.A. City College, calls and says, hey, Robert hasn't been showing up for work. They get a hold of a family member. The family member goes over, sees that the car's not there, and the lights are dark. And he's like, well, it doesn't appear that Robert's here. Maybe he took off somewhere, but we're still concerned. This is way out of character for him. And so they call the police. So the police um, go and they knock on the door. Um, they get permission to force entry. And as they go in, this is the first thing these two cops see. And of course, they've got their guns out, but it's very, very dark. There's just some real, you know, um, a, a small amount of light coming from a couple lamps. And they look in and they see Robert on his knees with his sh shoulders and head and his face buried in the cushions of the sofa. And then um, there's a huge, you know, 14, 15 inch butcher knife stuck in his back. And standing over him is this white guy, this big, bald white guy who's got nothing on but a pair of like tight shorts. Hmm. And the cop is just about to pull the trigger like he's freeze, don't move, you know, mm -hmm. type of thing. And then he realizes it, that it's a life-size cutout of Stone Cold Steve Austin <laughs> <laughs> who's, who's standing over the decedent with a butcher knife in his back. And, wow. and, 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 and as we tried to make sense of this whole thing, and, you know, you know, some of these people get into some really deviant activity, mm -hmm. deviant sexual activity. So there's this now turns into our crime scene. Robert's obviously. Did you guys arrest Stone Cold Steve Austin? <laughs> he, he wouldn't cooperate. He Take just stood there. They were like telling him he just would not come. Wouldn't listen to verbal commands. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Austin 316. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, just really bizarre things. And I remember thinking how, how this would, because uh, like the cop, I, I interviewed him. He said, I had like two and a half pounds of pressure on that trigger. I was just about ready to let it go. And I thought how that would have looked. I mean, you shoot this cut out. Of <laughs> say we've killed Stone Cold Steve Austin, who's uh, first on scene at this. That sounds like something in training when they're doing the, you know, yeah, yeah. the different targets are popping right. up. <laughs> Don't shoot Stone Cold Steve Austin when he pops up. We're living in uncertain times and millions have come to realize the importance of the Second Amendment. Yeah, if you're looking for the perfect accessory to go with that perfect firearm, get an American-made holster from my friends at We The People Holsters. Starting at just $40, We The People Holsters are custom molded to fit your exact firearm for a quick, smooth draw. They have thousands of options to choose from, plus a selection of custom printed holsters, including a line from Real Tree Camouflage. While you're there, check out their complete line of patriotic shirts and new EDC Tactical Gun Belt which comes with their exclusive talon buckle, which is manufactured 100% in the United States. Every holster and gun belt comes with a lifetime guarantee. If it's not a perfect fit, send it back for a full refund. Oh, and don't forget to pick up some bags of their mouth-watering bacon jerky. What? Did I hear that right? Yes, you heard correctly. Bacon jerky. So show your support for this show and this great American company. Go to wethepeopleholsters.com slash B, B-E-E, -E, right now. Get an additional $10 off with the offer code B10. Is that right? Yeah, B-E-E-1-0. -E -E wethepeopleholsters.com slash B-E-E. -E. wethepeopleholsters.com slash B-E-E. -E. Just, you know, weird little stories like that. I come and go in law. Oh, that's nothing. Ooh. I got a better one for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll just make up cops. That's what I say, and then yeah. we get one up and then that'll trigger something for him. <laughs> what about rookie stories? I mean, you, I can't imagine it being new to, especially like cases with murder and stuff like that. And when you first walk, I mean, most of us are so separate from that kind yeah. of thing. We never have to see it or experience it. What's it like for that to become like your day to day? Well, so when I was a rookie, I was in my really early twenties and, uh, so, you know, I didn't even have the, you know, personal maturity to be out. I shouldn't be, you know, I, I think 21 is a really young age to put somebody out on the streets. Yeah, that you know, is. You're trying to figure yourself out before you're trying yeah. to deal with worldly problems. So anyways, um, you go through a process, you know, you start off, you got a training officer, you slowly start to develop into, um, you know, learning how to do police work. And you, depending on what way you want to go in your career, you want to be an investigator, you want to be a supervisor, you want to go to SWAT, you want to fly helicopters, you want to do dogs. There's just so many different areas that you can kind of um, go into. Uh, for me, I always was fascinated with gangs. 
So mm-hmm. I started to get into, you know, understanding and developing my expertise on gangs. Um, but yeah, you, as a, as a young cop, you make mistakes, you know, you're overzealous. I crashed a lot of cars hmm. over driving <laughs> and uh, teachers, tell us each story. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, one time I hit this lady, you know, just real quick, I'm driving and, uh, the highway patrol is chasing some robbery suspects. It's really late at night. It's like one o'clock in the morning and we're on the streets of South central and they're flying by. We see the suspects go by in a sedan and then one lone CHP officer chasing him. And we're like, dang, jump in. So we're trying to catch up to this whole thing. We're flying. I think we're northbound on Broadway coming up to Slauson. And I see that they get through the intersection. And I see the cross, and they had, you know, the, the, the other police vehicle had its lights and sirens on. So I'm assuming that cross traffic, anybody on the road is going to be looking out, like, what's going on here? Police just flew through the intersection. So I'm gunning it, and I've got my lights and siren on. And this van pulls right out into the intersection in front of me. I didn't have time to react. And I center punched that thing <laughs> right on the side. And I hit it, I think I was like 70 miles an hour. Oh, my gosh. And I hit it so hard that this kid that was in the back seat, he wasn't strapped in. He was sitting in the rear seat of this van. He came out the side window and, and went right over the top of my car. Oh, he my He came gosh. right out the side window, went right out of the top of my car. My car is spinning out. The van is tumbling. Oh. And it goes, you know, 30, 40, 50 yards down the road, and it comes to rest on its side. So we, once we get our senses about us and I realized what had just happened, it was like that. And I hit it with so much inertia that that kid like just went right out the window. And uh, as they, as the car came to a rest, I get up and all I hear is the boom, 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 boom of the beat of the bass speakers. Mm. Like the music was so loud in that van. She never heard the sirens and wasn't paying attention. And so the lady that is now, who is the driver and the mother of this kid, she's standing with her feet on the ground, but like through the driver's window, because the van's on its side. So her feet are on the ground through the driver's window, and her head is just kind of poking out of the passenger window. So she's standing in the car, but, you know, kind of sideways. And she has this milkshake that had blown up on her, and and like French fries from McDonald's all stuck. (laughs) That's my nightmare when I'm like... (laughs) <laughs> you know, binging some kind of like Taco Bell. I'm like, man, if I get in a car wreck right now and die with this all over me, my wife, <laughs> it's going to be terrible. But it was this this surreal thing because I'm trying to make sense of this. And this kid, and I, you're not going to believe this is true, but I swear to you, this is the kid came out with so much force that he didn't get hurt at all. He wow. came right out with so much force. He landed right in the center of the intersection. He's just sitting there. And of course, he's got bruises and scratches oh and stuff, gosh. but no serious injuries at all. That's amazing. He came out so fast huh. that he wasn't injured. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. So that little uh, that little piece of judgment cost the city about $25,000. <laughs> <laughs> That's insane. That's never in cop shows. Like They get in lots of car wrecks, but kids never fly out of windows. Yeah. That's wild. I got lucky. I would have been really lucky. Well, Well, that's nothing. I I hit a school bus into the Grand Canyon. (laughs) 40 kids came flying out the window. (laughs) It's like Jiffy Pop. (laughs) That happened to me in Grand Theft Auto. (laughs) Yeah, we'll tell our Grand Theft Auto stories. stories. That's the only way we can do it. Where we go from there, man. That's well, I'm kind of letting you take the lead here because this is like your dream. You're you're hosting your own true crime podcast here, Ethan. Yeah, we got to. I would rather just do a case by case. Should just we do this? a whole new podcast? We well, you already this? have your own podcast, right? Well, I'm st- I'm hoping to start one. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. So I I I really want to do one. So we'll start right now. Okay. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. This is my debut sure. episode. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I really, I, I built one, a little studio at the house and I really want to do a, a podcast. And so I'm just trying to figure out, first of all, how to get, uh, you know, a platform to do it on. And, mm-hmm. and then I came up with this subject matter. I, uh, I don't know if you guys really, um, recall, but back in 2013, there was a rogue LAPD officer that, um, uh, went on a shooting rampage all over South right. Cal- Southern California. So I think that is the, I'm going to do a series on that. Because I hooked up with one of the primary investigators on it, and he has all the mm. material, and so that was the guy was shooting cops, and then he went yeah. up to the cabin, and exactly yeah, right. I remember up, that. Up, we watched it all live. I was like, yeah. <laughs> I remember when Dave Chappelle talked about that? It was weird. He was he almost sounded like he was sympathetic to the guy. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a topic I've seen you talk a bit about. I mean, there's that whole uh, rivalry between the cops, and I don't know if the black community is the right 
way to put it, but there's this, I mean, even right now, my own, my own daughter is 14. She's, she's never met a cop in her life, but she's caught up into this a cab. All cop donkey. Right. It's such a straw man blanket thing to say. It's, it's obviously on its face, a dumb thing to say, but uh, it's almost so dumb. You can't argue with it. And I don't know what to, <laughs> I don't know. So what's your reaction to that? Uh, just that whole culture. I mean, what do you, I don't even know what you do with that. But, it's discouraging. I don't think people actually realize what they're thinking and saying. Oftentimes, especially this younger generation, they're very emotional mm -hmm. and uh, they don't really, I think either haven't really had the life experiences to understand what a, a society would look like without having gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the whole idea that, you know, all these cops are bad and generally like all cops are donkey. Bad. Listen, everybody out there that I worked with and, you know, I spent you know, 25 years on the job and, um, you know, in the last 10 years doing private investigations, but still interacting with law enforcement all the time. And everybody's out there trying to do the right thing. Yeah, we have our bad seats, just like any profession does. You have people that didn't belong there and shouldn't be there. And you do your best to try to weed them out. And then the problem is, is that when they screw up, it reflects on everybody. You know, everybody, it's guilt by association. Right. And uh, but the reality is that I would say 98 percent of the guys, a strong 98 percent of the people out there want to do good work, want to do it right and want to make sure that the, that the, the communities are safe and that they're well served. That's that's 98 hmm. percent. And uh, it may even go up as high as 99. But we're going to have our rotten apples. And right. unfortunately, they screw up and we all have to suffer the consequences. Yeah, I remember, uh, I saw, I can't remember who this was, but talking about, you know, if you were to just percentage wise with the amount of people that live in the, in America, uh, to try to make it so that there never was another white cop shooting a black guy situation, just, just on sheer percentage wise, you just have to turn it into a police state because there's mm. so many people in their country to, just for it to happen, you know, a few times a year because of our media, it becomes this massive story. But like these situations, it's almost like there's no way to, that's the hopeless feeling. Like, how do we ever get out of it? Like, you know, because there's always going to be these, these situations are going to come up. Like, I don't know how you make it just never, ever happen again. You can't, they're going to come up. Right. They're absolutely unavoidable. You know, as long as there's lawlessness, there's going to be conflict in, in our society. If there's lawlessness, there's going to be law enforcement and those are going to collide. Sometimes they collide rather peacefully or they can, you know, coexist peacefully in the sense that you can go and apprehend somebody without having to tase them or, you know, s struggle with them. But there's going to be those people that just aren't willing to go along with the program and that's going to create conflict and it's going to, you know, um, you know, it's going to exacerbate into somebody getting shot at some point in time. It's unavoidable. You know, we just can't do anything about that as long as there's crime. I mean, you would have been with LAPD during the whole Rodney King thing, yes? Mm -hmm. How was that? <laughs> yeah, so the riots were wild. Yeah. Oh, man. You know, so the, the riots were you. wild. And, but law enforcement's cyclical. You know, we're heroes one day, yeah, villains sure. the next. Heroes <laughs> one day, villain. You know, after 9-11, of course, everybody was praising first responders. And then, of course, the George Floyd thing happens. And now we're just a bunch of evil people out there taking advantage of, you know, um, uh, you know less fortunate people. And, but it'll come back, we'll, you know, it'll just keep ebbing and flowing because that's the way it's always been. You know, we had mm -hmm. the riots back in the 60s, you know, in yeah. uh, South Central. You know, think about what we thought of the military back when Kent State happened, you know. And so and then we become heroes and then we become zeros. Heroes and zeros. So <laughs> <laughs> we're just up and down. Yeah. Hmm. So what's your, I mean, if you don't mind me asking, it's, I, I find it really interesting to ask an actual cop this question, like, what do you make of Chauvin, the Chauvin trial and that whole situation with George Floyd? Well, I knew right away um, what the problem was, you know, excited um, delirium. It's a medical condition. And when you have all of those contributing factors that Floyd had, it's not completely unusual for his heart to stop, mm -hmm. for him to suffer cardiac arrest or, you know, to, uh, um, you know, to struggle so much with his breathing that that leads to cardiac arrest. So, you know, it, we knew immediately anybody in law enforcement that's dealt with a lot of uses of forces understood exactly what that was. 
probably under the influence, may be having some other physiological issues, med, you know, med, medical issues, which he ended up having. And those all just contribute to this perfect storm of a situation where somebody is, um, um, their body just can't hold up. Hmm. Uh, you know, s kneeling on somebody's back and even the upper back in between the shoulder blades, we've always done that. Maybe it was a, you know, it was a long time. So I'm not going to argue with the amount of time because it seems to me that was extensive. Um, but I think the overreaction, the public overreaction, because um, they always do this. It's a knee jerk reaction before all the facts come in. If we just hold off a little bit and allow the facts to determine what happened, we're not going to have as much conflict and, and uh, animosity. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it happens all the time, you know, where we mm -hmm. this, socially, we just react to some, you know, clip on television or we j react to some YouTube clip or TikTok, whatever it is. Right. And then it leads to um, all, th all types of different issues. And then we find out later, it's like, wait a minute, there was a lot more to this story. Yeah. That had you waited, you wouldn't have felt like you felt. Well, it seems like people are building up a brick wall to that, like, they're pretty like the, the immediate feeling. If you see a YouTube video, if you don't immediately judge jury executioner right there and expo and put out your opinion online, you're, you're already assumed to be, it feels like you're already assumed to be racist or biased just by not, by not waiting for like all the facts to come out. And it feels like even now, like it feel it, it felt like to me through that trial, like it was just decided from the beginning by, mm -hmm. by culture. Right. And, uh, and it feels more and more like, uh, just by saying like, what are the facts that's become like too controversial to say that it is you can't, if, if you make sense anymore, then you're a bigot or a rate, you know, you can't even have, um, to even engage in conversation these days is oftentimes untolerated. Mm -hmm. It's just unbelievable. Yeah. And no, I, I mean, I want to believe the average person doesn't think that way, but it seems like the, the people with the loudest voices do think that way. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what they're trying to gain by it. Um, yeah. We seem like we're on a really slippery slope, don't yes. we? Like we're just on a really slippery slope downward. And, you know, I was having a conversation the other day with somebody and I just, I almost feel like it's hopeless. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, save the uh, coming of, uh, you know, a perfect, <laughs> you know, a, somebody to, to put things right. Robocop. Uh, yeah. Well, I was thinking more in the term of a <laughs> messiah. Oh, okay. he was trying to make a theological. Yeah, I was. I was yeah, going yeah, there with it. Yeah, he proposed doing theology and cop work. How do you, yeah, do you have the a theology? theology co uh, do, you have a, do you have a philosophy behind justice, or, justice uh, or good and evil and stuff like that? Or? Well, I do just in the sense that, you know, when you really have the conversation, if you're just working through the conversation you're ultimately going to get to this point, you know, is there an objective rule maker, mm. you know, or is it just, you know, relative morality? And uh, if it's relative morality, we all just kind of become our own gods. We decide what's good and bad and blah, 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 and judge everybody by our own, you know, set of principles. But if you walk, you know, if you have, if you walk the conversation all the way to the point where um, there has to be, a transcendent, a transcendent rule maker, right? There has to be somebody that puts the rules and then we need to recognize and be obedient to those rules. Otherwise, we end up with just, like I said, moral relativism, and that is just an absolute disaster when you walk it through. Hmm. I like this idea now. It's giving me a, a, a satirical article idea of the morally relativistic cops. <laughs> 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 like, freeze, that is not preferable societal moment, behavior yeah. <laughs> the, yeah. at this point in history yeah. <laughs> because look at all of our laws ultimately lead back there they have to have some type of independent transcendent rule maker right. right that's all laws are based on that i mean just traditionally just go back in time and I mean, you have to have that conviction that the human that a human being has a certain level of value that isn't scientifically provable we just all agree to believe it Mm -hmm. And that is like a breakdown of like, you see a culture that doesn't hold that and then just sees people as like fodder. But I find that fascinating just on watching some crime shows like first 48 or whatever, where, you know, you see a guy who was like clearly living just a terrible life and was going to get shot at some point was just like dealing drugs and shooting people. And then he got shot and the lengths that the cops go to, to like bring his killers to justice, right. mm -hmm. you know, and he, 
he really was playing stupid games and got stupid prizes kind of thing. And yeah, but they don't judge it on a scale. Like, they don't well, do, he was kind of an idiot. They go, so, he's a human yeah. being. He's, right. <laughs> he's got dignity and he deserves to be brought to justice. And like, I find that I'm very proud of that being part of a culture that's like that. Mm-hmm. But it seems like a lot of people see the opposite. <laughs> and that's why I don't know. I see that and I go, I, I guess there are bad cops, but that's, there's something really beautiful there. You know, and you're coming into that community and trying to solve that murder. I think it's, really honorable yeah I good job do. Yeah. thanks i appreciate that <laughs> yeah we because we do we hold life you know every life has value you know and uh, uh our actions need to be judged obviously and held accountable for the things we do but at the end of the day um, there's still value to every single person um and so a victim of you know a gang member who gets shot committing gang crimes mm-hmm um, we still look at it as a person with value. Yeah. Summer is here, and all you people that live in states that have winter, it's time for you to get out your T-shirts. Look at this. Babylon Bee T-shirts. These are amazing. Oh, man. Hey, I want this one. I don't even have one of these. Mm. I'm going to take this one. That's take the this blue one. one. That's the blue origin. It's got blue origin. Very nice. <laughs> and uh, look, at on the back, it says Babylon Bee. That's so cool. Mm-hmm. This one says support fake journalism. And it's got kind of a grungy feel the grungy for look. the Seattle people. Yeah. Designed by Ethan, our Gen X grunge. Yeah, guy. I like the Gen X grunge. That grunge look. Kind of nice. Yeah. And Andrew's holding one Weather. up, even though he's disavowing Whoa. the Babylon Bee. Yep. He's holding it up. Take this disavow. company. I'm taking this I shirt disavow. home taking to the shirt. do something terrible to it. Yes, to burn it. Certainly not wear it. Yeah, buy shirts and then burn them if you hate it. Oh, yep. here's one that's unexpected. Oh, it's, it's just the Babylon B on a shirt. I do have that mm-hmm. one. I like that one. There you go. Babylon B logo. So check it out. Shop.babylonb.com. We have a ton of shirts, hats, all kinds of goodies. That's awesome. Buy Good some quality. shirts, guys. And if you're a subscriber, you got your discount. Yeah. Ooh. Boom. In your email. You get one of those cases where it's like stuck with you. Like one of the ones that's like, oh man. Or is that a lot of them? And you get all the files open on your desk. If I could just solve this one. <laughs> I guess that was Big Ant Tupac. But you did that. <laughs> that. Well, that brings up a great point because you do have to separate yourself yeah. um, it, to, to stay, you know, psychologically healthy. And if you just become so absorbed in mm-hmm. what your job and your responsibility and your identity of as a cop, you can kind of really lose yourself. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, it can lead to all kinds of problems. So, you know, I think there's a lot to be said about being able to go to work, do a really good job, but at the same time, um, keep everything in perspective so that you're not um, losing your own identity outside of your professional identity. Hmm. Because there are cops, man, and they just, once they retire, they don't even know what to do with themselves. Hmm. Because everything about them has been this thing, and they don't know how to do anything else. Defund the police. Yes or no? <laughs> you try it. See what happens. <laughs> yeah. Seems like they're trying it. Mm-hmm. Well, it's funny you're talking about these cycles and all these yeah. cities that have defunded the police. They're like, refund the police. <laughs> you know, they just, refund the, a few very quick. more police. <laughs> Every time I hear, uh, you know, people talking about it, I'm from law enforcement, you know, when we joke about it, obviously, because it's so, it's so ridiculous. Um, we're like, hey, man, go ahead. Because we're all going to get huge raises once they realize what's, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you're a private investigator now. Yeah. <clears throat> so without cracking my voice, you're a private investigator now. Yeah. And uh, we all have our image of that being like MacGyver or something. But what's that? What's what is private investigation like? What do you mainly do? It's, it's, I'm a general investigator. There's, okay. there's a lot of private investigators that are niche. You know, they have, you know, a guy that just will do polygraphs or somebody that just does, you know, or just computer forensics and that type mm-hmm. of thing. So I'm general. I, so I do just anything that comes in the door. Um, but it's a variety, you know, sometimes we're um, uh, dealing with law enforcement cases where a person is not completely satisfied with the outcome of their investigation and they want to have another set of eyes look at it. Um, you know, occasionally we deal with infidelity cases, child custody cases. I did a really cool case um, on a, on um, um, stolen artwork that took <laughs> us all over like four countries trying to track down some artwork of a celebrity wow. who had his uh, 
his prized possessions taken. So it's a variety of things. It's a lot of fun. And there's no, there's no bureaucracy or supervision. That's the liberating thing about it. Mm -hmm. You know, on the job, you've got to get permission from supervisors and go through all these, you know, protocols and law and in, in private investigations, you're kind of just your own boss. So when you walk up on a crime scene, they're like, this isn't your jurisdiction, Kading. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you walk up in your trench coat. Yeah. Curse you, Kading. Yeah. <laughs> <It's like a laughs> I don't play by your rules. I don't play Go by write them. another book, you fool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have to throw anybody under the bus in your book? Um, just the people that needed to be thrown under the bus. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's like, uh, and do you ever have any, uh, do you ever say any cool puns when you come up on a dead body, like you're smoking and you, you don't drive the button to the guy? You, you, or just right before you punch a guy. You find the guy in the, in the refrigerator and he's frozen and you're mm -hmm. like, looks like he's out cold. Can you, <laughs> nothing like that? Uh, uh, that's funny. You take me back to when I was in the academy. <laughs> yes, he does we have a story. Where the they're training you quips. <laughs> they do the quip training course. <laughs> we had to go and do a tour of the, um, the coroner's office. Oh. So we do a tour of the coroner's office. We're in the academy. We're just, you know, I've never been exposed to a bunch of, you know, bodies laying around on gurneys. And we're walking along, and I recognize there's the corpse of this. Um, um, <laughs> this is horrible. There's a corpse <laughs> of a um, Asian female, mm -hmm. and she was unidentified. Mm. And on her toe tag, it said "long gone." Long gone. <laughs> Oh, God. <laughs> That's horrible, right? <laughs> Is that like Jane Doe? <laughs> exactly. That's what they call them? It was the version, it was the uh, Asian version of Jane Doe. Wow. Long gone. <laughs> we came up with that. <laughs> we at the Babylon Bee condemn uh, this hatred <laughs> this, yeah. and bigotry. <laughs> well, um. this, is, this, is, this illustrates kind of the morbid uh, humor right. in law humor, yeah. Yeah, gallows humor right. of law enforcement. So <laughs> uh, obviously somebody at the medical examiner's office is making light of it, knowing that us, us recruits oh. are going to walk through there and see that. <laughs> gotcha. So, yeah. That's a target. Do you, do you have to go to autopsies? Wait, did you have to go to autopsies as a detective? Yeah. Like yeah. Gross, like super gross, because I couldn't imagine. When yeah. you were a rookie, you were the guy that like barfed in the trash. In the Typically, you're only attending an autopsy if you're a homicide investigator. Okay. So you're there to kind of, you know, learn what you can from the um, examination of the corpse um, or the decedent. Um, and they, it was the worst. I hated attending autopsies. Uh, just there's a stench mm -hmm. that you can't get out of your clothes. Mm -hmm. And um, it's like cigars. It's oh, it's it's so much worse. I'd have rather <laughs> been just smoking a cigar during the autopsies just to get, um, you know, <laughs> to drown out the. Uh, it's, it's probably frowned upon. They probably used to be able to do that. <laughs> Not anymore. Yeah, it's just putrid. Mm. So I didn't like autopsies. But it, one of the things that I thought was so fascinating is how colorful the body is. Hmm. You know, how yellow fat is and how there's these really, you know, interesting, bold colors. Hmm. You know, it's, just, it's not just all like, you know, brandy looking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hmm. It's kind of beautiful. It's like a, a big tie. -dye. We're like <laughs> we're like wearing we're all wearing tie dye shirts inside. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, should we go to our subscriber Let's portion? Let's go to our like subscriber the deep, portion. Deep, dark, dirty stories that can't be told Stuff on the public. Stuff you can't say publicly. Because this is the ungoogleable portion of the show. You can't get canceled. It's only with our paid subscribers. So we'll go there, get the super dark, grizzled stories, and uh, we'll go deep. And, and uh, we'll ask Greg what his favorite two we'll have Greg, song is. So. Greg will perfect. interrogate Kyle. Oh, perfect. <laughs> Great. Just reenact an interrogation. <laughs> we got lights. We got some pipes. You need him with a pipe. Do you I don't know what you use. Like, a, like hit me with a pipe, like a lead pipe? Or threaten him with it. I don't okay. know. What do you do? Well, if you need the kind of... The swinging... The swinging uh, light bulb. Yeah. Swinging light bulb. Yeah, a single bulb. Do you smoke you a cigar or a cigarette while you interrogate? I wouldn't, but I would have a pack there in order to offer over oh, okay. to somebody so they'd be nice and relaxed. So mm. you can use tequila. You can use just so You don't anything. like hold the cigarette up to their eye and be like... <laughs> 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 well, it depends on how cooperative they are. <laughs> he, he, More on that in the subscriber <laughs> portion. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, let's go. Coming up next for Babylon B subscribers. Wait, I remember one time... No, oh, that's a long story. I just regret. No, long story. Please, please. Wildest thing I've ever saw. Mm. And I just like really liberally application of pepper spray. And of course he just turns and keeps running. So I open the gate and run right into my own bank of pepper spray. Oh. <laughs> yeah. No one's gonna believe this, but I'm telling you exactly how this happened. Group of kids that were doing those burglaries, right? Mm -hmm. And Orlando Bloom's house was one of the ones that they kept. Oh really? 
Enjoying this hard-hitting interview? Become a Babylon Bee subscriber to hear the rest of this conversation. Go to BabylonBee.com slash plans for full-length ad-free podcasts. Kyle and Ethan would like to thank Seth Dillon for paying the bills, Adam Ford for creating their job, the other writers for tirelessly pitching headlines, the subscribers, and you, the listener. Until next time, this is Dave D'Andrea, the voice of the Babylon Bee, 